This video is sponsored by Raycon. 2004's psychological thriller The Butterfly Effect asks one simple question. What if you could change your past to create a better future? In the eyes of cynics, it could be said this question has become a bit of a philosophical cliché given the countless works of art and fiction that utilise it, but that doesn't make it any less effective when it's a question I'm sure many, if not all of you, have asked yourselves at some point in your life, especially during times of overwhelming hardship. The Butterfly Effect aimed to transcend just being a literal portrayal of the question by exploring not only the turbulence of life's spontaneous and unexplainable ways, but begins dabbling in the nihilism of what the point of your existence really means. Every time I try to help someone, everything just goes to shit. It follows the basic concept of chaos theory which, according to Britannica, can be primitively summarised as the science of unpredictability and randomness in things we can determine. One strand of chaos theory defined by Edward Lorenz, known as the butterfly effect, suggests that one small, seemingly insignificant change can affect everything that follows, like how the flap of a butterfly's wings can change the weather. Or to put it in the more articulate words of Abe Simpson, If you ever travel back in time, don't step on anything, because even the tiniest change can alter the future in ways you can't imagine. It tells the story of Evan, as he experiences a series of seemingly random blackouts throughout his harrowing childhood, and later in life discovers that he has the ability to time travel back to those blackouts and change events in order to correct what he thinks will result in the best possible future. As you can imagine, things go down the crapper pretty quickly, as every time he tries to fix a broken outcome, things get continuously worse as he gradually comes to the painful realisation that no matter what he does, he will never find the perfect outcome, because perfection does not exist. That's the broad gist of Evan's emotional journey. He wants to manufacture a timeline that's right for everyone, but as we all know, that's simply not how life works. It's an impossible expectation to think everything will go your way, and to be honest, it can be very difficult to accept that the world is outside your control, no matter how big or small. There is no right. You can't change who people are without destroying who they were. Who says you can't make things better? While The Butterfly Effect was a major hit at the box office and it was commendable to see Ashton Kutcher attempt to go against his usual typecasting as a quirky romantic lead, the film received a considerably nasty scathing from critics, if indeed I do agree with some of the criticisms. In fact, Guardian writer Peter Bradshaw later highlighted that the most likely reason for this partially unfair dislike came down to one thing. Ashton Kutcher was not a great actor, and most of his film and television work was negatively received by critics. I mean, I personally have nothing against the guy because I've barely seen any of his work and have a guilty soft spot for Dude Where's My Car, but I definitely remember this strangely hostile sentiment. He was basically part of a conveyor belt of replaceable Hollywood male leads with the charisma of wet wood because he didn't have a gimmick like most of them today. And while this is partially the case with his performance in The Butterfly Effect, to his credit, there is a genuineness to his efforts, especially in one later scene that proves that he and Amy Smart were more than capable of hitting the raw emotional beats that the film tries so hard to achieve. That you were happy once. You know, there's one major hole in your story. There's no fucking way on this planet or any other I would ever be in some fucking sorority. As a stylistic overview, The Butterfly Effect is a mix between Donnie Darko for its convoluted philosophy, time travel and gloomy depiction of American suburbia, Requiem for a Dream for its blatant overindulgence in misery porn, as you're about to see, and weirdly enough, Final Destination because, aside from the concept of changing things to influence the future and all the shocking amounts of violence I did not expect, it was actually co-written and first time directed by the writers of Final Destination. Destination 2. To call it excessive at times would be an understatement because the butterfly effect relies heavily on throwing as many provocative things at you as possible, in case you forget that, yep, this is definitely a tragedy, alright. And I know that you got them, and you're gonna give them to me! You're not gonna hide them from me! I want them! <laughs> 
Seriously, I am not being hyperbolic when I say this is one of the most genuinely depressing films I have ever seen. It has everything YouTube hates me talking about. Diddlers, Nazis, murder, cancer, suicide, drug addiction, and a dog being burned alive. While I won't obviously show you anything too suggestive out of respect for those who do relate to the subject matter, I will be honest in saying that despite deeply admiring its grueling ambition, its melodramatic barrage of bleakness and soap opera delivery stopped it from ever truly resonating with me in the way I wanted it to. In fact, this film originally had one incredibly cruel ending, but we have a lot to get through before I come to this, and I want to leave a spoiler warning now because I will be walking through the plot as we go along. Now, one last thing, if you want to listen to your favourite content with scrumptious quality sound, extra bass, and the sweet amount of noise isolation to drown out the chaos around you, then what you need are Raycon's Everyday E25 earbuds. Whether you're always on the go, chilling in the summer weather, or hiding indoors because screw that, it's too hot, Raycon's lightweight feel and soft, comfortable fit are the perfect way to stay plugged in while living your day-to-day -day life. Recently, I've been back at competitive sport, and to get myself focused, my coach had me create a relaxing playlist, and thanks to Raycon's seamless Bluetooth pairing and 6 hours of playtime, I just pop them in, hit play, and put them right back into their stylish compact case before I step on court without any thought or hassle. They've been an essential part of my survival kit for a long time now, especially when I'm getting up early in the morning or trying to relax after a work intensive day. Seriously, having Raycons around means I literally have instant escapism ready to go to prevent me from lobbing my computer out a window. Raycon are all about the customer customer experience by prioritizing premium wireless audio without inflated premium prices, and if you're not convinced, maybe a recommendation from Snoop Dogg might be your thing, or hell, why not just try them out for yourself, and if you're not satisfied, Raycon offer a 45 day free return policy. So click the link in the description box below or go to buyraycon.com slash Ryan to get 15% off your order, and if you have done so, please 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 let me know what you think of them in the comments below. The first 30 minutes of the butterfly effect essentially show us Evan's childhood flash before his eyes, yet despite all his extremely negative experiences, he seems to emerge as a pretty normal guy in college, while those around him seem to have suffered from the traumas of their experiences. He's lost contact with his childhood crush Kaylee, who now lives on the brink of emotional breakdown. His best friend Lenny lives reclusively with his parents due to the severe shock of a mailbox explosion that killed a mother and her baby, and Kaylee's violent psychotic brother Tommy, who murdered Evan's dog when he was younger, is shortly about to be released from prison. However, when Evan finds his old childhood journals that his psychiatrist encouraged him to write as a means of recording his blackouts, he eventually learns that these blackouts were periods in which his older self travelled back in time with all his current knowledge intact and influenced the outcome of events to change the future he returns to in the hopes of helping those who suffered. Now, before we get into the specifics, the film maintains a surprisingly strong consistency that's typically hard to achieve with time travel stories because of smartasses obsessed with finding plot holes and everything. What are you doing with that knife? Well, that didn't work. <laughs> All the changes happen for mostly logical and organic reasons, and the film explains itself coherently enough that you're likely not going to find yourself too confused. It's not like a Christopher Nolan film trying to smugly trick you, it has a pretty accessible way of delivering what is technically a non-linear storyline. Although I will admit that there is one glaring plot hole that I can't overlook because it does have an impact on the story, where Evan attempts to prove his abilities to someone in the future by scarring himself in the past, but... If these are all new timelines that Evan creates each time he changes something, how does the other guy remember the previous one? I mean, it literally shows you how one change causes a chain reaction of events that lead to a different outcome every time. Anyway, that's the only time I was pulled out of the fantasy. Everything else generally makes sense, and there are quite a few callbacks to previous timelines that show the film's inventive nature. For example, in one timeline, Evan's college roommate Thumper, that is his name, an obligatory early 2000s goth guy, I'm getting some urban legend flashbacks here, is bullied by a fraternity and in a later timeline, Evan is now part of that fraternity and is the guy who originally mocked Thumper. 
Uh, 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 Alpha, 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 and that's the kind of emotional whiplash that the film constantly throws at you. If there's one thing that's chillingly real about the film, it's the suddenness of how quickly things change, playing right into the heart of chaos. Narratively, in terms of direction and setup, Kaylee's death seems out of nowhere, but these signs can be invisible and it's unfortunately an all too real event. As such, Evan acts impulsively on his abilities to time travel, thinking he can save Kaylee in another timeline. But I feel there's an unintentionally different type of moral conflict thrown in here that might be a polarizing opinion, so let me know your thoughts. You see, it's not simply that Evan's actions have drastic consequences, although that is the broad point of it, it's that the motive behind those actions could be the thing at fault, because I felt like his motive was inherently driven more by this underlying selfish desire to get the outcome he wants. You should be where I am. Evan returns to the moment when Kaylee's father photographed her and Evan as kids, and for as heavy as the subject matter is, this is where we get the film's melodramatic overtone lapsing into unintentional comedy, as adult Evan uses his seven-year-old self to convince this monster not to be a pedophile. And it actually works, I swear to god I'm not making this up. It's time for you to do what I tell you to do. Wrong answer, fuckbag. This is the very moment of your reckoning. Evan then returns to a timeline where he and Kaylee are together, yet that sense of selfishness I felt immediately creeps back in as the focus seems less on Kaylee being alive and more on Evan being satisfied that he got the happily ever after he always wanted. In fact, this supposedly perfect timeline is cut short by Tommy's arrival out of prison, which sees Evan kill him during an altercation, leading to Evan being sent to prison himself. You protect me. However, brace yourself. Instead of accepting responsibility for his actions and living in this timeline that he desperately wanted before he himself made it shit, he recruits his religious cellmate by convincing him he's a time traveling Jesus and kills an Aryan gang who stole his childhood journal so he can change the timeline again. You see what I mean when I said this film struggled to emotionally resonate with me? Seriously, reading the plot out loud makes Homer's time-traveling toasters seem just as believable. Anyway, the point I wanted to make was that Evan behaves impulsively without forethought when it comes to time travel. He seems to think he can just constantly change things until everything is right, i.e. trying to find this impossible perfection. But in the next timeline, a frightening spanner is thrown in the works. Every time Evan time travels, he experiences seizures that are revealed to be brain damage from the new information he obtains from the various timelines. In other words, time traveling back and forth is slowly killing him, and thus adds a sense of urgency and consideration towards his next move. He's basically growing more emotionally mature towards his actions as he begins realizing his own selfishness and tries to fight back against it, as we'll see in the fifth timeline. In the third timeline, in order to prevent Tommy from turning hostile towards Evan after getting out of prison, Evan goes back in time to convince Tommy not to kill his dog and walk away from his violent life, like what Evan did with Kaylee's father. However, just as this seems to work, Lenny fucking shanks Tommy in the neck, killing him, and Kaylee is left even more traumatized that she runs away and becomes a drug-addicted sex worker in the fourth timeline. What it does is calls attention to one consistent, unchanging trend in every timeline. Evan always seems to get the best outcome, as his friends are the ones who suffer the consequences. Sure, time travel is killing him, but he's doing all of this off his own free will. It isn't until he meets Kaylee in the fourth timeline does she tell Evan exactly what he needs to hear. He's ruining their lives in order to fix his own, and this perspective comes right into play in the fifth timeline. 
So now wanting to once again fix Lenny and Kaylee's future, Evan returns to the day of the mailbox explosion and warns the mother before it kills her and her baby, leading to Evan becoming a quadriplegic. What the fuck is this? The aim of this timeline is to show Evan that this is actually the best outcome possible for his friends, but at the expense of his own happiness. Not only is Lenny happy and healthy and Evan's college roommate, but he's now dating Kaylee while Tommy has become a Christian. Evan realises everyone's lives are perfect but his own, but after discovering that his own mother is actually the one to suffer more than him, he decides to change this timeline to ensure that, regardless of what happens to him, everyone around him will be safe and better. While I do think the fifth timeline is handled insensitively in places, it is still emotionally heavy from the perspective that Evan is succumbing to the depression of seeing constant suffering, but ultimately finds his strength in his desire to help people, even if it's at the cost of himself. What ends up happening is Evan completely screwing up his own plan and accidentally killing Kaylee himself and awakening in a psychiatric hospital where the journals that allowed him to time travel do not exist. Now is about the time we should address Evan's father, who earlier in the story is institutionalised in a psychiatric hospital for claiming to have the same abilities as Evan. Throughout the story, the blackouts are described as simply an illness hereditarily passed on by his father, but in this timeline, the time travel is literally just mental illness where Evan has succumbed to the same condition as his father. It's Evan's final interaction with his father that brings about the film's bleakest existential point, where his father tells him that the only way to end the family curse, so to speak, is through death, as the curse should have ended with his father. In fact, his father even tries to strangle Evan as a child, but before he succeeds, he's, uh, incapacit- no, 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 he's killed. Basically, Evan's entire existence is perceived as the problem, as he is solely responsible for the chaos that transpires, and since the outcomes are infinite, it's impossible to know what the correct predetermined course of events truly were. Yeah, it's not the most pleasant thematic point, but trust me, it gets a hell of a lot worse when we talk about that notorious director's cut. In the theatrical ending, Evan finds a way to travel back one last time using an old video, and in a bittersweet conclusion, he chooses to make it so that he and Kaylee never met by threatening her, meaning she and Tommy stayed with their mother instead of their abusive father, and none of the preceding events ever take place. In the end, everyone moves on with their lives and Evan walks past the Kaylee he never met, accepting that sometimes the outcome might not be in your favour, but it's ultimately the best for you and those you care about. Now, there are two slight variations in the theatrical ending where either Evan engages with Kaylee or it leaves the final moment ambiguous. However, the director's cut sees Evan return to when he was a baby still in his mother's womb and strangles himself to death with his own umbilical cord, thus his preceding life never existed. I will give you a moment to process that. Okay, that's enough. I'll be honest, while I don't prefer it, I do appreciate some aspects of this ending because it is technically more consistent to the nihilism of the story, that is, Evan's father makes it clear that the only way to stop things from getting worse is if the timeline ended with him. It must end with me. Is there a word more intense than depressing? Because that would be it. It hits this heart obliterating thought that some of us have probably said at some point in our lives, things would be better if I just never existed. That's obviously not true, because we're not in control of everything, and as bleak as the story feels at times, it does make a real earnest point about accepting when it's time to stop trying to create a future that does not exist. I have desperately and obsessively tried to fix many things in my life and make everything better, and the hardest part is always letting go. Not everything is meant to be, and that's okay, if you constantly chase the impossible, you'll never find fulfilment. 
That's what makes the theatrical ending feel the most real to me. Evan doesn't overcome his pain, he learns to live with it, accepting that this wasn't a fairy tale love story, but rather a breakup story, where the outcome doesn't look perfect, but given how they can both now live lives they're in control of as much as they truly can be, says everything about the journey we cannot predict.